A recent article I read claimed that Jesus talked more about money than heaven and hell combined. Um, It also said that in the article that um, out of his 39 parables, 11 of them, that's just over a quarter, 11 of them mention money in some way. Now, I, I didn't go and do my own research on that to check up on what he's saying. Um, we know, we know just from what we had today, the reading we had today, that, that Jesus has some very important things to say about money and he's very clear about it. For Jesus, our attitude, my attitude, your attitude towards money says something about our hearts. It's not, it's not just a thing. It actually uh, deeply affects us spiritually and morally. And, and that comes out in the teaching of Jesus in Matthew 6. And I'm sure as we come to the teachings of Jesus and think about what he says, um, there'll be challenges for us, but um, there'll also be encouragement and help as we think it through. And today we're going to go beyond Matthew 6 to other parts of scripture to help us understand what a gospel-centered approach to our money ought to be. And, and, and we are going to head towards 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, which I've referred to in the newsletter, and, and maybe some of you have done your homework and read that already. That would be great because we're just going to touch on a few points from that passage. So that's where we're heading. But before we even go to Matthew 6 and then on to uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, um, I, I want to do a little, little bit of Old Testament background, and I want to go to a um, PowerPoint presentation that I came up with many years ago. Um, and we used to run this PowerPoint presentation during the times we used to take up offering just, just for some variety and reflection. And it appears um, that way before the Mosaic law came into being, tithing was in practice, and ancient cultures, regardless of religion, practiced the idea of tithing as giving back to God. And that, does, that might even include God's say were well, false gods, but they still had this concept that um, there, there are greater beings that we need to owe um, something and give back towards. So it was common um, in the culture, in, in ancient culture, and um, I might even dare to say it might even go all the way back to Adam and Eve. Remember, um, Cain and Abel knew something about the sacrificial system and the importance of sacrificing the first fruits to God. So it's not out of the realm to think that they also understood this idea um, in some way of tithing. Maybe it's built into human DNA, cultural DNA somehow. Um, as a result of this um, cultural background, Abraham gave 10% of the spoils from war when he rescued Lot. He gave 10% um, to Melchizedek, the ancient priest of the Most High God. And Jacob... Later on, when Jacob had his dream, you know, the ladder and the angels going up and down into heaven, when he woke up, he set up an altar and he promised to give 10% of everything God blessed him with in the future, that he was going to return that to God. All that happened before the Mosaic Law. And what happens with the Mosaic Law is that the principle of, of tithing was formalized into a rule. And it might look like a tax. We could probably loosely call it a, a tax. But it was part of the contract. If you are my people, show me the respect by giving back a percentage of what I bless you with. And it was essential for the, for the running of the temple, which was at the heart of, of leading people in the worship of God and keeping them focused on the Lord. And it was also used for helping the poor around them. And if we really looked at, at through the Old Testament, you'd see that Israel, um, the, the baseline was they were to give 10%, but there were other offerings, which would, some people say, actually raise regular giving to about 13%. But there were also free will offerings, so they could give out of the generosity of their hearts, not just what was the baseline, but to be thankful for the Lord, there was the extra free will offerings to express that thankfulness. Okay, so that's our lightning um, uh, introduction to the background of the Old Testament because it's also the background to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6. Um, let me um, 
read again some of those words. Matthew 6, and I'm going to pick up at verse 19 and um, read through to 24. Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up treasures, store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, then your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or to be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Where is your treasure? Because that's where your heart is. What Jesus says appears quite straightforward in many ways, doesn't it? It's not beating around the bush at all. Earthly things have a use-by date. And in fact, you have a use-by date. Um, if your earthly things don't wear out first, you will wear out. You know, you know, whatever you've gathered, you have to leave behind. You know, we always say, you can't take it with you. And, and that's just stating the obvious. You cannot take it with you. And, and, and when you think about that, it sounds a little bit depressing. But what Jesus is trying to do here is to save us from depression, of realising everything we gain and all our treasures we can't take with us. He's here to save us from depression and, un, and lib, liberate us from an unhealthy focus on, on money and stuff, earthly stuff, that um, are useful in the short term, but not in the long term. Jesus wants you and me to disconnect our souls from over-investing in temporary things. Another thing we can make out of these verses just quickly is that Jesus wants you and me to see that we are bigger than our years here just on planet Earth. This is not everything. And, and if we are part of his kingdom through faith, we have eternal life, an amazing treasure waits for us in the world to come. It's written in scripture somewhere, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. Now we, we can get excited about this world and the things that we have, but, but God's word is telling us that even the best of things are nothing compared to what God is preparing for us. And, and that's so important for us to realise that, that, that we are bigger than just the short years of life here. Our destiny is bigger. The things that we have now, as pleasurable and as good as they might be, um, they're, just, they're just the start of God's blessings in, in what's to come. And uh, another lesson here is that we need to let the Heavenly Father be master, be the master and the guiding principle of your life. Not money, not materialism. Um, Money and, money and wealth put such a strong hold on us that Jesus makes it clear that it is an indirect competition. It can be in direct competition to the way we relate to our Heavenly Father. That's how powerful money is. That's why Jesus spoke about it so often. That's why it's a window into our hearts because it grabs us and, and distracts us from trusting in God and we think this is what we're going to trust in. This is where I'm going to put my efforts. This is what gives me my delight in life. Um, it is in direct competition if we get it in the wrong perspective. And Jesus is making it clear that you cannot love money 
Um, just the other week, I mentioned the um, rich young ruler, and he was a good man, and Jesus liked him. He said, one thing you lack, just go sell everything you've got. And he couldn't do it because he loved money more than he loved actually worshipping God. It has a powerful and dangerous effect on us and we need to not only separate our, ourselves from it um, emotionally, but we need to realise that it can become our master. And we don't want it to be our master. Don't let it be your master, is what Jesus is saying. And... Um, the, the point of those verses, 22 and 23, which look kind of strange about the, the eye and the darkness, um, is that, that if our eye is on earthly treasures, then, then spiritual darkness enters into, into us because the light is not coming in by focusing on, on the Heavenly Father and his way. So, so it leads us into spiritual darkness. Even if we're Christians, our souls become darker when we focus on materialism rather than the things of God. Now, it's kind of easy to say, but what does that mean in real life? That's why I'm thinking that what Jesus says on the surface is, um, is quite straightforward, but putting it into practice can be quite difficult. Um, the next section, which I, I won't touch on other than refer to, when Jesus says, don't worry about what you will have each day and the you know, reference of the birds of the air and the flowers of the field... Um, what he's trying to say there is food and clothing and shelter are all necessities. They're all important things. We need them. But firstly, we need to work on understanding the difference between what we need and what we want, the necessities versus the luxuries. And the second thing Jesus is saying in that next section is that we need to trust the Heavenly Father who watches over us. We have a Heavenly Father who cares. And what does that mean in the way that you, you, you wrestle and worry about your daily necessities? I want to take it a step further and go to our theme of, of tithing as we started at the beginning. Because I think tithing can help us to understand in a practical way of what Jesus is getting at. Tithing was a formalised part of the Mosaic law, but the idea behind tithing is really practical. It's a really practical way of making the Heavenly Father the one you trust rather than money. Let me share some brief points to tease that out a little bit. A considered and deliberate systematic giving back to God in portion to how he has blessed you that is a way of demonstrating you believe in his sovereignty over everything in your life. You don't have to be the master of getting food on the table. Ultimately, God will make sure he will care for you. A second consideration is a considered and a deliberate and a systematic giving back to God is essential for running a church. It was essential for running the temple and, and, and focusing on how to worship God. And, and it's essential for the local church. That's just a fact of life. We can't avoid that. And um, the, the, the more store, as it were, um, that the local church has, the more it can do. The more it can um, represent Jesus and spread the wonderful news of Jesus to the local community and beyond. It's just a re reality. We need money for running local churches. Uh, a third idea is that a, a considered and deliberate and systematic giving back to God can help you or can help prevent you from making decisions which might end up um, compromising your ability to serve the Lord and give to his work. For instance, if you're getting a loan from the bank, now the person in charge of the loan might just kind of look at your income or incomes and say, well, okay, we can just work out how this all happens, um, and might not take into consideration that you want to give a certain portion of your income to your local church or to a missionary. But you should, 
The idea in the Old Testament was the first, the top 10% goes to the Lord. And I think it's a great way to think because you say, okay, so 10% of what I'm going to give is going to the Lord. And after that, I work out my budget. After that, I work out what kind of loan I can get. After that, I can work out what kind of niceties of life I can add in. The top 10%, as it were, goes to the Lord. And that rescues us from making decisions which can actually stop us from giving to the work of God. Another point is this. While 10% is not a law in the Christian church, it's not a law in the New Testament, it was just a mosaic law, it's not a law, but it's a great starting point. But the key principle, the overall principle, I think, is this. Making a percentage commitment and sticking to it. I think that's part of the genius of the idea of tithing, is making a percentage commitment and sticking to it. Life will test you. You know, how many times do you hear someone say, look, oh, my car's broken down, Um, my fridge needs replacing, Um, it's at the time I need to start paying all these other bills, And, and so life comes crashing in. And that's when you're really tested about how you give and how you balance your funds. How will you respond when you're really tested? Um, Anne and I went to Donvale while we were on holidays just recently and Gerald told this story about a, a farmer who had a cow that gave birth to twins. And um, he thought about that and he said, well, look, I'll give one of the calves to God. I'll dedicate it to God. And um, his wife said, well, which one? And he said, oh, I haven't made up my mind yet. Which one? And just before he was about to sell them at market, one calf died. And he went into his wife and he said, the Lord's calf has died. (laughs) How often are you and I tempted to spend the Lord's portion on ourselves. I think that's when we're really tested about our loyalty to the things of God and whether we put the kingdom of God first. The Lord's calf has died. How many of the Lord's calves have died in your life? So setting a percentage and sticking to it, it can save our hearts from ourselves, and it can save us from shifting our loyalty to what we um, have promised when the going gets tough. Another thought about percentage is this. Percentage is fair. It's a fair way of looking at your income. And if your income changes, so does the amount you give. The idea of tithing is, is, is a flexible idea, and it goes with the ups and downs of life. Imagine if you're having a particularly good year and say, oh, I've got this fantastic job. I'll, I'll, um, I, I, I promise the Lord a million dollars. And global financial crisis, you've lost your job. You can no longer fulfil your promise. But if you said, I'm going to give X percent, it is so much easier to keep your promise to the Lord. There is some, something of a genius involved in this idea of percentage. And um, tithing also makes the rich and the poor equal before God because it's not a matter of Bill Gates giving his 10% versus me giving my 10%, for instance. All, All the Lord wants to know is, have you been faithful with the money that I have given you, with the portion that I have given you? So there's a fairness in that as well, and God sees us differently It's not favouring the rich. So just a few thoughts on how just a simple idea of tithing, whether you want to call it 10% or a slightly different percentage, how that can help you live out what Jesus is saying in Matthew 6. But before we actually go to um, our next passage, um, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, chapter, um, 8 and 9, 
Um, let's just, just think about what is the bottom line of what we've been saying. And I think the bottom line is this. The idea of having a considered and deliberate tithing is a practical way for you to store up treasure on, in heaven rather than on earth. And it's a really practical way to show that you understand that your life has a greater purpose. And it's a really practical way to saying God is involved in my daily life and I trust that he's involved in my daily life. And I think it also means that by tithing and doing it deliberately, it means that you are actually investing. You are investing a portion of what you earn in eternal things. The spreading of the gospel, the spreading of the good news. It's investing in an eternal investment that will never wear out and ultimately what you are investing in is the souls of people who yet do not know Jesus or even the souls of those of us who know Jesus and, and it's helping us to grow to be more like Jesus. It's the heavenly investment. Okay. With that, let's now shift to 2 Corinthians. And the reason why I want to go to 2 Corinthians is because it refers to Christian giving in action. Let's pick up 2 Corinthians um, chapter 8. And um, I'm going to read from um, verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. No, I'll read from verse 1. Sorry, yeah, I'll read from verse 1 down to verse 7. Verse 9 will come in a moment. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I will testify that they gave as much as they were able, even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring a completion to this act of grace on your behalf. Just as as you excelled in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. A key word here is generosity. And the generosity referred to as an act of grace, this grace of giving. Now, we're not fully sure of what the background of this was, but there was a financial crisis um, amongst the Christians in Jerusalem. And uh, the Apostle Paul was, um, what, was seeking to raise money and, 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 and go back to Jerusalem with some money to help the Christian church, where, where the Christian church started, you know, the original um, starting point for the whole gospel, the first church. And, and, and the Macedonians weren't well off, but they said, we want to be part of this. And they gave, and they gave us, gave until it hurt. They gave sacrificially. They gave over and above because their hearts were moved for this need. And ultimately, they were moved by the gospel. And uh, this is kind of what Paul's getting at right down there in verse 9. He says, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. What he's saying is that it, it, the gospel changes how we think about wealth and poverty and he's saying Jesus gave up the riches of heaven and he died in abject poverty upon a criminal's cross so that we who were absolutely destitute before God might gain his riches and enjoy his riches. Jesus gave up riches, became poor so that we who were poor could become rich. And the Macedonian Christians got a hold of that. And, 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 and that, was, that was something that moved them and shaped the way that they thought about everything. So, 
We've thought about your treasure. Where's your heart? Where's your treasure? Now let's think about your generosity and my generosity. Giving back to God should not be seen as just a matter of duty. I must do it. But it ought to be an expression of thankfulness. It should be a joy to us that we can participate in giving back to God for the work of God on planet Earth. And thinking about what Jesus did for me should radically change the way that I think about money and I think about especially giving to the church and, and to many needs. If I say, oh, I'm already giving 10% to God's, God's work and that's the end of the matter, well, then I think that shows that I'm not acting out of a generous heart. It's actually more legalism. Oh, I'm doing this, therefore I don't need to do any more. But a Christian, by the example of the Macedonians, a Christian is motivated by generosity. I think it's better to say something like, if we're talking about tithing, that um, 10% is just a starting point. The more wealthy you are, the more you can go way beyond that. I think it's also, as we think about it as a starting point, I think it's hard to imagine that God would expect less from us who know the wonder of the gospel than he expected from his Old Testament people, the Old Testament church. Why would he expect less from us? We know more. We know Jesus. And, and we can debate all this, and I'm sure some of you might want to debate it. But I think that when you take, you have to take the Old Testament teaching into account to really understand what New Testament generosity means. Generosity is over and above, it is sacrificial, it is willing, and it is done with joy. Years ago, the Home Missions Committee put out a, um, a little pamphlet called I Don't Believe in Tithing. And it's a story of an elder, a Presbyterian elder, who said, look, I don't, I don't need to think about tithing because I'm a generous giver. And his pastor challenged him to actually work out the mathematics of it. And he was giving a fraction of a tithe, and he was so embarrassed. So the Old Testament really does help us. The Old Testament informs us. But be, um, before, before I wrap up and um, uh, go back to my uh, old slide on, on giving... Let us go to chapter 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and I'm just going to read this, and I think it's self-explanatory, and if you haven't already read through these two passages, please do so uh, um, later today. But let's go to a 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and I'm going to pick it up from verse 6, and hear what the Apostle Paul is saying, hear what the Holy Spirit is saying um, through the Apostle Paul to you and me. Verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Let's just leave it there for the moment. Be generous in your giving. Be deliberate in your giving. Be willing in your giving. And you will be useful to the Lord in every good work. And you will be blessed by the Lord. Let's go back. As we wrap up to our PowerPoint, my PowerPoint, the Old Testament indicates that tithing was around long before the Mosaic Law. It became part of an official way of um, living in God's covenant community to run the temple and help the poor. But also, there was always the opportunity to give way more than 10% and show generosity and thankfulness to the Lord God. Then we move into the New Testament. 
And the New Testament shows us the chief motivation for giving back to God, that the generosity is to flow from a thankful heart for the gift of salvation. And a key verse that we can take with us as we think about giving is about Jesus. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. So that through his poverty you might become rich. So the Old Testament, as I down, have down the bottom, the Old Testament provides some guiding principles, but the New Testament provides the ultimate motivation for giving back to God for his work on earth. In the end, the ultimate motivation is all about Jesus, isn't it? It's what he teaches us, but it's what he did for us most of all. So may the Heavenly Father speak to you and me through the ministry of Jesus and make us cheerful givers. May the Heavenly Father speak to you and me through the ministry of Jesus to make us confident that he will look after us if we put him first. May the Heavenly Father speak to you and me through the ministry of Jesus to be more devoted to treasures in heaven than the earthly things that we love, but they're temporary. Let me pray for us. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you speak to us about all things in life, all things that we need to know about in order to live in a way that's fruitful and joyful and a way that's blessing because it's in line with your will. We thank you for the way that you talk about even the most practical things and that is how we even handle our money. We also give you thanks that there's that principle that you understand that we need it. And, and most of what we earn, we can use on ourselves. But you are also calling us to think about giving back to you and to do it generously and willingly and to give back knowing that we're investing in eternal things. May Jesus, his example and his teaching and his life motivate us as we think about these things. In his great name we pray. Amen.